literally eight people die every single day, eight young people die every single day because of unsafe um, and unstored guns. Um, so welcome, Ms. Lee. Uh, we are so excited to have you here. Due to the pandemic, this episode of Pizza and Politics is virtual. So unfortunately, there is no pizza. However, we wanted to ask you, when did you think, when do you think um, the, is the best time to eat pizza? When do I think, okay, so I think that for me, it's right away or it's the day after. <laughs> so, so it's, there's no in between, like, you know, when it's set on the table for 45 minutes, like the, the window's closed, but day old refrigerated pizza around, you know, 10 PM is really good time. Okay. So jumping right into it, uh, how do you think, how, how did you first get started in politics? And can you tell us what is, what is it, what is it like to be a city council member? Mm. So my, my path to politics was, um, was, was started very early, actually. I, I grew up in a very multicultural family, uh, a very politically activated family. So I grew up going to rallies and marches. And, um, and so I was no stranger to activism. And, um, and when my family hit hard times and I was about 16 years old, I ended up in public housing. And, um, and I worked about 32 hours a week when I was in high school um, at a video movie store when they had VHS, and, um, which I don't even know if you know what that is, and, um, and also a bakery. And so um, you know, I've, I, I had some tough cards dealt to me and it was really good policy and strong community ties that, that helped lift me up, that helped me get into college, that helped me succeed and um, work at the UN and found two nonprofits um, and a, a social impact startup. And so my, my work has always centered around my values and giving people and paying forward the gift of opportunity that I had um, and the gift of support and justice, the seed of justice that was planted in me and making sure that I um, that I have, I feel very deeply that I have an obligation to, um, to instill that and impart that in, um, in those around me and to heal myself and to heal the communities that I'm a part of through the work that I do. So um, I never saw myself going to council and being an elected official. I always thought of myself as a background person and I had to be convinced like many women, especially women of color, um, it was it was not something that was a model. I'm actually the first Asian woman to ever serve on this council, and um, it's it was 2019 when I was appointed, and so it took a lot of convincing and a lot of people saying, "We need you. We need your voice. Your voice matters. Your 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 voice is your voice is all but absent, um, and you represent us, and we need representation. And please step forward. And please step forward. And we got your back." And, um, and it was a lot of, a lot of conversations. And so I, um, I rallied, I, um, I really mobilized a lot of support from the community and was ultimately appointed to the council to, to fill a vacancy. And then I ran a, an at-large campaign. So the largest election cycle, the largest and most expensive election cycle in the history of San Mateo. Um, and I, um, I ran a 100% grassroots campaign and was successful in um, getting elected to another four-year term. So uh, can you tell me like what was the uh, first thing that you did as an acting council member and why? Yes, I will. Actually, it's, it's, a, it's a story I'm really proud of. Um, you know, municipal government works very slowly. I mean, almost glacially <laughs> slowly. Like, it's like watching your fingernails grow sometimes. <laughs> and so, um, so I knew that in order to get anything done, I needed to be a bridge between the policy um, work that I was doing on the council and the community organizing work that I was part of my uh, wheelhouse, part of my, you know, my, my, my come up, my come up with. And so um, bridging that gap is very important to me. And so my first meeting of my first council session, I mobilized 
moms demand action um, again uh, for gun safety and gun sense. And, um, and we pushed forward, that was not an agenda item. It was not part of the decision that was coming forward and basically pushed it onto the agenda um, to pass a safe gun storage ordinance, which requires all firearms to be locked um, safely. And, um, and so, you know, this is actually a really important issue, especially during the pandemic now, because we've seen a, an uptick in, um, in gun purchases and a, and a downward spiral in mental health, right? Um, so more sick people, more stressed people, more depressed people, more isolated people are now owning guns. Um, and you might know, as young people that 75% of, um, of the attacks at schools were, were done using guns that were acquired through homes um, and, um, and unlocked. So when, you know, when people, when young people and, and, and sick people get their hands on guns, um, people die. And, and that means eight, like t literally eight people die every single day, eight young people die every single day because of unsafe um, and unstored guns. So that was a really key issue and we ended up passing it. Wow, thank you, um, very insightful. Um, so like many cities in the Bay Area, San Mateo has a large housing, how, how, um, excuse me, large housing crisis. How do you plan on tackling it in the city of San Mateo? It's a great question. I'm so glad that you're asking about housing. And it's one of my key issues, um, having my life saved literally by public housing. So um, so this is something that's not theoretical. It's very personal to me. Um, and I, I'm happy to say that our city is really, um, is, is very supportive of affordable housing. Our community is very supportive of affordable housing. And one of the opportunities, the key opportunities that um, we're looking at as a city is where is there public land that can be used more efficiently? Um, and there are several sites actually downtown, three sites, one site that we already converted into a 100% affordable project and built you know, 250 units where a parking lot used to be. <laughs> and, um, and there are also two more surplus land lots that, um, that also have opportunity for housing development and affordable housing development, potentially for seniors or, or um, permanent supportive housing for formerly homeless. So, you know, thinking about how we can use our land assets more efficiently that are within the scope of the city. And we know that, you know, financing affordable housing and financing any housing is really is really challenging, and the, um, the the funding is very is getting more and more competitive, and so the feasibility of projects is really is is very strained right now. And so one of the things that a city like ours can do is say, okay, well we can take the cost down significantly by land leasing to this affordable housing developer for a, a dollar a year, right? Um, and then a project that seem, that would be impossible now is possible. And it shows our value. It's like out walking our values. Like, where's the investment? Like, where does the road meet the rubber, right? It's in where, do we, where are we finding these opportunities and when are we pulling the trigger to make sure that, um, that we're really maximizing the full potential of every land asset that we have. How have... How have the social distancing restrictions affected your work and connecting to the community? In what ways have you been successful in reaching the community? Um, so this was the first, as I said, the first um, at-large uh, campaign that was ever run um, that synced with the general election cycle. So it was the largest. And, I have a public health background and I felt, um, I felt uncomfortable knocking on doors um, as a candidate. I just, you know, there's just too many people that have, you know, are immune compromised. And I just felt like it would make people really uncomfortable to do door knocking. And so um, one of the ways that we reached out to the community was through phone banking and texting. And I had a team of like over a hundred Gen Z volunteers, kids like you. And, um, and it was, 
uh, it was amazing, like, uh, like literally an army. And we were burning through the, the, the rosters, just like, you know, I think one night, I think our, I think we, our one night, one event um, was like over 2000 contacts in like a couple hours. And so, um, so we've, we've made really good use of um, social media and um, phone banking and text banking just to reach out to voters and um, to be really intentional. I also, you know, I also had um, a Latino outreach um, event. I had, a, a, you know, an Asian outreach event and making sure that my volunteers spoke multiple languages and that, um, that we are really touching everybody. Um, and, and that, that's, you know, that's one of the most important parts of, of this work. You know, we're not, um, you know, as council members, we shouldn't be like up here on a hill and accessible. Like, we need to go to where the community is. And, and I find, you know, I, I really pride myself on being very proactive and very transparent in terms of making people, making myself known and accessible and making my policy positions and my work really clear. And so I have a blog, I have, um, you know, I have a very active Instagram page at any given time. You all should go and check me out. I'm like learning how to roller ski and um and and I share my life and I don't like I feel like you know the job is answering to you and to to the community and showing you what I'm doing and what I'm about because it's in service to you and the community and so I'm not trying to hide behind the dais I'm making my life very open and my positions very clear So we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us, but why do you think students should take time out of their busy day uh, to learn about the government and engage in it as well? Um, well, I think, you know, I, I think the, the answer to that question is, you know, what is it, what's in it for me? Um, and as long as you're breathing air and you're drinking water <laughs> and, and you plan to live with the house over your head, um, you have a vested interest in what happens at, at, um, at every level of government. And I always say, you know, that we all, we have to remember that local municipal government. So, you know, your city council is the closest layer of government to you. This is the front lines of democracy. You can, and you should be calling on your city council members and saying, Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> like, what, what are you, what are you working on? Because I care about this issue. So, what are you doing about it? Or I want to learn more. Or how can I help you? Right. Um, the these, you know, at at a at a city council level, your access is very real, and you can hold you can hold your council members to the fire to um, a level of accountability that I think is actually un unparalleled. I'm going to, I'm shopping on, you know, at the same grocery stores that you are. I'm bringing my kids to the same parks that you're, you know, that you grew up playing on. And so, um, so I am like your neighbor essentially. So you should be able to contact me and see how you can support and how you can get involved and know, know in your heart that the decisions that are being made today are going to impact your life today and every day of your life for the rest of your life in this community.